It's really a great pleasure to be here, both an honor to discuss your book and, and to do it here. I guess the difference between uh, uh, urban and AEI is that you're putting on party hats on tax day. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we've hey, got a different attitude. Tax policy uh, center wouldn't exist if we didn't have income tax. <laughs> but, 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 I, but I also would like to say that, that it's a especially a uh, honor and pleasure to be here to discuss precisely this book because uh, uh, very early in my career, uh, the Brookings Papers uh, sort of bet on my research early and let me write a Brookings Paper on some of the stuff that started in my dissertation. I think to this day that Brookings Paper on uh, user cost elasticities and how user costs affect capital, as co-authored with Glenn, uh, is one of my most cited papers. And, and it started a research agenda that's really quite relevant uh, for this book. I, I'd also like to say that, that I, I really uh, enjoyed your presentation uh, because it had the same uh, attitude about academic debate uh, that you have in the book, but I don't often see in reviews of your book, uh, which is that I think it's the job of the academics and the, the public intellectuals uh, to think about the future as being a bunch of coexisting quantum paths, and that our job is to look at a path that might happen and to define it really precisely. A and I think that, that really it's a courageous book. Like so many economists are, are sort of on the one hand, on the other hand, maybe this, maybe that. But you take uh, in, in the part of the book that I actually like the best, the, the, the part that you said people will disagree with and that I disagree with, the thing that's wonderful about it is that it, that it really precisely defines something that could happen. That, as you call it, terrifying, I think, in the conclusion, and it's true. And if there's a quantum path that might happen that's terrifying, then understanding what it looks like and what you might do to stop it is, is crucial. Uh, so, so in, in my uh, role, though, as devil's advocate, or maybe uh, some in the audience would think of me as the angel's advocate, uh, that I think is to talk about the things in the book that give me pause, uh, and that's the thing I'm going to do first. Uh, and and uh, I can say that if anything that, that I say is something that you want more time to respond to, to, let me just give you an open invite. You can come to AEI, and we can continue the discussion at any point. <laughs> I'll fly you in from Paris if you want to come back and say I did so, something that you, don't, you disagree with or you have better data on or something like that. But it's in that spirit that I want to uh, point out some things that I think that in the, the negative scenario that's getting a lot of attention, the sort of capitalism destroys itself scenario, uh, some things that make me not so worried about that scenario. Uh, and then, uh, but then I don't want to just have a sort of negative effect uh, or, or negative attitude of, towards my role here. I, I also want to then sort of put up an alternative view of what capitalism is doing and how it's functioning in our society here. Uh, and, and then try to define it as precisely as you have with yours so that we've got a couple of competing views that we could then talk about. And, and, and you know, preemptively, I want to say that, that my description of this alternative view, uh, that, that I have the same attitude towards it that you conveyed in your discussion, that, that it could be, could be true, might not be. Um, so, so I apologize that, that I've got slides with a lot of words on it and, and my eyes are bad and that, that thing is a little small but I can sort of see it. But, but I think that it, it, Thomas didn't really go into the, uh, the, the nuances of the sort of negative scenario, but the basic idea is this, that if, if capital increases, uh, then it should drive down uh, the return on capital. Uh, but if the return on capital decline, declines kind of slowly, suppose it didn't decline at all if capital went up, then the capital income share uh, would go up uh, and that it's possible to conceive of a scenario uh, where the capital income share basically explodes uh, and capitalists get more and more of, of the national income. Uh, and, and correctly, uh, uh, the Tomas shows that uh, in order to have that happen, you need to have a, a high elasticity of substitution, elasticity of substitution between capital and labor uh, greater than one. Now this goes back to my first Brookings paper uh, because with a CES production, the user cost elasticity is, is exactly uh, uh, similar. There are other ways that people have estimated this, but, but I can remember when I first presented, uh, our, our, we first presented our estimates of the elasticity, user cost elasticity, and got numbers sort of between 0.5 and 1, uh, then uh, Jane, Jane Gravel, I, I wish Jane was here, got up and, and, and gave this angry discussion because our elasticity was way too large. Uh, and, and it's just kind of nice to be in a position where, where the elasticity that I think is kind of true is finally smaller than what somebody else uh, thinks. But, but I think that get, getting bigger than one, for me, I, I, th I know that there's a paper that, that you guys cite that gets there, but it seems kind of implausible to me, in part because the user cost elasticities that I see uh, and, and the elasticity substitutions that are estimated in the literature uh, are often looking at equipment. And I can sort of understand how you might have like a robot at McDonald's who could make a hamburger. Uh, but, but about half of capital is structures, uh, a, a little bit less. 
Uh, and I don't really understand uh, ex ex exactly how we're going to get a lot of substitutability between structures and, and labor, and that's in their capital measure. Uh, a CBO review by Jennifer Gravel, uh, Jane's daughter, uh, reviewed the elasticity of substitution literature recently and said 0. 0.6 is probably about the right answer. Uh, there's somebody who made a, a comment at uh, Tyler Cowen's website about gross versus net. I think Tomah had a good response to that, but it is still something of a problem that if you're looking at net production, then a gross elasticity uh, has to be you know, a lot bigger than one to have the net uh, bigger than one. And so my conclusion of, about the capital income share exploding is that it doesn't really seem like a terrifyingly uh, likely scenario to me uh, unless I put a lot of Bayesian weight on, on the, the little corners of the literature that are finding bigger than one. Um, but it doesn't mean that as an abstract principle 20 years down the road we don't need to worry about this because you know robots eventually will be good enough that they can do most everything. And at that point, what's the capital share? Uh, the, 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 happy, uh, the happy ending to that, though, might be that it's, we live in a world like Star Trek, where commander data does everything and there's no scarcity. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a dark uh, scenario. Um, my second point is that I think that the case for the policy recommendations hasn't really been made. Uh, and, and, and for this, again, the, there's this literature that goes back. There was this big joint tax uh, committee uh, symposium on uh, fundamental tax reform and what it did, would do to the economy. Uh, Alan Auerbach and I wrote a book in 2005 where we reviewed the literature. And, and basically, it's a standard in, in, uh, in th this room, especially, uh, for people to talk about consumption taxation and fundamental tax reform and the growth effects that you could get out of it. Uh, the, the idea of consumption tax is really, really, really quite intuitive. Uh, and it's just that if you think of consumption today as being an apple and consumption you know, 10 years from now as being an orange, uh, then if you accept the principle that you don't want to distort decisions between apples and oranges, then as soon as you're taxing capital income, then you're imposing a tax wedge that explodes to infinity over time. And generally, if you're trying to minimize distortion, then having a tax wedge that goes to infinity is not going to be something that you see. Now, now, I think that one of the problems I have with the, with the proposals uh, it, that, that I've seen both in the book and, and other, other places from, from Emmanuel, uh, is, is that I, I, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, that, that they dispose of the consumption tax literature a little bit too loosely for my taste. Uh, and, an example of the kind of uh, fuzzy thinking that I think are, 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 are unacceptably uh, obscure thinking in this space is that Diamond and Saez, uh, uh in their uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives uh, article argue against Chomley and Judd it, by saying, well, uh, we don't worry about a tax wedge that exposed to infinity over time uh, because uh, we have overlapping generations. And uh, in a model with overlapping generations and no bequests, uh, then the tax wedge that explodes over time won't matter. Uh, but, but to sort of rely on intuition like that, where in a model with no bequests, then the, the optimal tax uh, that we've been talking about in this room for a long time isn't admissible, uh, is an odd choice to make when one of the main problems that you're trying to address with your policy proposal is, is inheritance. Uh, and, and so I think that that's, that's a kind of uh, inconsistency that, uh, that I find not attractive. Uh, and in fact, even Diamond and Saez say, uh, with regard to the wealth tax, that confiscatory uh, wealth taxation, and this is the, the third bullet, uh, would affect saving and have uh, serious efficiency costs. Uh, and so, and, and the final thing on, on the case for the policy recommendation be not being, so at first I think that the, the existing literature was, was uh, I, I guess, uh, released too quickly from, from our consciousness. But the second thing is, and this is interesting, that, that Len and I, over burritos and everything else, have been arguing about tax policy for a very long time now. We're, we're getting, we have gray hair, you might notice. And, 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 uh, and the thing that, that I, one of the things that we've agreed is that the difference between me and Len is that Len tends to think that elasticities are smaller and I tend to think that they're larger. The interesting thing is that if the elasticity of substitution really is bigger than one, then uh, the benefit of a consumption tax skyrockets. Uh, in fact, there's a Jane, Jane has a paper uh, with Kent Smetters and the, and the list of co-authors uh, where they take the elasticity of substitution from 0.5 to 1 and the benefit of consumption taxation about it goes up 80%, 78%. Uh, and so if you're in a world where we're going to ignore the optimal tax literature, uh, then uh, we have to think about why are we doing that, but we should be less likely to do it, I would assert, if we're going to believe that the elasticity of substitution is large. Uh, and that's, that's again, a sort of it's incons inconsistency in the book that kind of uh, plagues me. Uh, the, the next point about the book that, that I wanted to make uh, is that 
that I think that there's a little bit of, I call it the house of cards, uh, this slide, but, but if you look at the data, and, and, and again, in, in the spirit of, of academic uh, debate, uh, you guys have been fantastic making all your data public. If you dig around, it looks to me like uh, a huge fraction of the increase in K over Y uh, and RK over Y is coming from housing. Uh, and uh, you know, housing, uh, I'll get to show you a chart in a minute, is it makes the, the whole way of thinking about it that's presented in the book, I think it, it's a challenge to it. Uh, because first of all, uh, you, you know, is housing substituting for people with umbrellas? Like how is it that I should think about housing and labor substitutability? Uh, but second, uh, housing is the one thing that, it, I have a paper from the 90s that I updated the calculations for today, uh, where we estimated golden rule capital stocks. And the housing capital stock in the US seems to be uh, way above the golden rule. So that it's the only place in the capital space where we're dynamically inefficient. Uh, and, and so we should have a really low return on housing. But we have a really, had a really high in, in your data, uh, which suggests that the way you're thinking about it might not be the whole story. That it could be what's driven the increase in capital share in the US has been the housing bubble for example, uh, which is something that's outside of the realm of sort of neoclassical growth theory. Uh, I guess it's hard to see this chart, but this is from your QJE paper. If you look at the last column, and, and these slides will be available online, it's just that the housing returns are really, really large. And for some of the countries, they're bigger than 100% of, of the gain um, that you see. And this is my golden rule update. Yeah, you can see that, that uh, at least by one measure of the golden rule, the housing capital stock is too large. Um, Next thing, uh, and I'm, I'm almost to the point where I'm going to uh, stop uh, you know, picking nits. Uh, that if you accept uh, Xavier Salé Martin's point that capitalism has reduced global inequality, uh, then I, I think that my understanding is that the focus on individual country inequality, it, it, my, my first intuition was it made sense because countries are the sort of political organisms that we want to analyze. That's where politics happen. Uh, and, uh, and so, I think that capitalism has led to a decline in inequality uh, globally, but uh, definitely in inequality is increasing in the developed world. Uh, my, my problem with, again, sort of internal intellectual consistency is that if I'm going to ignore global inequality, uh, but then propose a global wealth tax, which requires a global government, uh, that it seems like that's inconsistent, uh, that we need to talk about it. And the reason why that inconsistency might matter is that if in the developed world we're, we, we fr lose, fact, uh, lo lose, lose track of the fact that capitalism has helped so many poor people around the world, uh, and then decide that we're so worried that capitalism is going to destroy us all that we have this confiscatory taxes, uh, then would we really expect the developing world to continue to be pro-capitalist and to use the capitalism to reduce inequality? Uh, I think you know, maybe even the IMF is going to start ordering them to have wealth tax taxes, uh, because that's what we all accept. Uh, and so that's another thing that I'm concerned about. Uh, and so now let's uh, uh, look at another view, another uh, sort of possible take on, on the data uh, that describes a completely different story about how our capitalist society has evolved from the one that uh, Thomas has presented, uh, which I think uh, might be uh, at least equally plausibly true. Uh, so we just took data. I think this is pretty consistent with, with your stuff, but I wanted to be making the, ch the charts myself. And this will all be available on the website here. Yep. and also at AEI, and if anyone wants to see the calculations, we'll, we'll share those too. But this is just uh, the income uh, share of the top 5% of households of the U.S., and, and as Toma has documented with much uh, you know, more careful analysis than this, it's gone up a lot. It's gone up by about, uh, uh, by my estimates from the CPS, about, about 5% uh, uh, since 1970. But something that's not discussed much in the book, uh, although uh, with a book this large and ambitious, there might be parts that I missed where it was discussed in detail, and I apologize for that, is that over the same time period, it's kind of interesting, but transfer payments as a percentage of GDP went up by almost the same amount. I would say maybe about 6%. 6 uh, and so if you're looking at pre-tax pre income and the share to the top uh, going up a lot, uh, and then saying, well, that's a metric that society is not just, uh, and you ignore the increase of transfers, then you're not really you know, giving the whole society a fair shake uh, in how just it is. Uh, and uh, so if you look at the US Gini coefficient post-tax, post-transfer, it's gone up. And so it's gotten a little bit worse. But it's not nearly as striking as, as the top 1% uh, charts that, that Thomas presents. Uh, and uh, one could argue also, and, and this is something that Aparna Matur and I have been doing since 2005, that, that if you really want to be all in uh, estimating how society is treating both the wealthy and the poor, then what we should look at is consumption. Hobbes argued we should always look at consumption because it's what people take out of society. 
then if you look at uh, the latest, and this is just a, a straight uh, pull off of the CEX, uh, uh, if you look at the latest movements in consumption expenditures, uh, they've been going up for both uh, the bottom uh, quintile and the top quintile. And the bottom actually has gone up a, a little bit more recently because the top folks uh, had all the wealth that was destroyed uh, in the uh, Great Recession. Uh, and if you look at Gini coefficients on consumption in the US, they haven't really moved much at all, which is uh, consistent with the idea that those transfers that we saw exploding were more or less offsetting the, uh, the divergence of the income distribution. Uh, and uh, this is if you think, well, let's, not, let's look at shares instead, which is uh, the approach that Thomas uh, prefers with income, then you see those look pretty flat. And so uh, the summary of recent movements then in inequality for me, and this is the alternative quantum uh, uh, path uh, that if this continues, is that our society has really increased transfers a lot, uh, and the pre-tax in income distribution has gotten a lot more une unequal, uh, but the increase in transfers has about offset that, and consumption, uh, the consumption pattern has been uh, quite stable, and even consistent with political stability and uh, sustained capitalism as far as the eye could see, provided that those transfer programs uh, can be supported politically and well-financed. And, and I would argue, uh, before I go to my last thing, because I want to talk about uh, Schumpeter, uh, who, who had great respect for Marx's, uh, Marx's intellectual accomplishments and, and would have loved to discuss this book, Schumpeter. Uh, and so I wanted to think a little bit about what, what he would have said uh, as in closing. But, but the last thing is that I think that, that those charts that I showed on consumption, there should be some kind of bipartisan agreement that that's, uh, that's the thing that we ought to look at and that's what's, what policy ought to accomplish. And if people redo my consumption calculations and find that the pattern looks a little bit different, then we should adjust the transfer programs because that uh, for me is a metric of whether society is, is providing growth that's helping everybody, uh, not necessarily just pre-tax income. Um, so, so here's the interesting thing, uh, and, and I found Schumpeter very, very compelling. Uh, Schumpeter and Marx agreed that capitalism was going to destroy itself, uh, but for different reasons. Uh, Schump Schumpeter thought uh, first that Marx was wrong, that, that growth was going to uh, slow down, that we'd get too much capital, uh, and that there'd be massive increase in inequality. And he wrote, he actually first started writing about this in the teens, but, but, but way, way back in ex-ante theory, he said that in 1978, 50 years later, uh, that the share of the wealthy would be about the same. Uh, and you've shown that it is, but it went down a lot and then went back up, and you're saying, oh, well, if it continues on that path, that's, that's going to lead to a fundamentally different world. Uh, and so Schumpeter would potentially look at the data uh, that's presented in your book and say, see, I was right. And then the question is about the future, which is the thing that we know the least about. So, so I think the last thing uh, uh, is that, that, that Schumpeter said, so why was Schumpeter negative about it? Uh, Schumpeter thought that as we got richer and richer, what was going to happen would be that all of our kids would go to universities. And when they went to universities, uh, they would be more and more over time presented with a professoriate that was really anti-capitalist. Uh, and uh, you can read my, my slide. I don't have time to read the whole thing. But, but he thought that, uh, that the problem would be that academics would be digging deeper and deeper to try to find flaws in capitalism and would be proselytizing against it all the time. Um, I would argue that, uh, and it's certainly not the case, that that's what's going on in this book. But if you look at some of the discussions in the book, I think that Schumpeter would find uh, that that is an echo of what he thought was going to happen. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much for giving me a little extra time, Len.